uh, been going through the Gospel of Luke as we march week by week uh, through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through Luke's Gospel. And so we're going to continue to do that this morning as we look at the next passage of Scripture that comes in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, at this time, has been making a long trek through the towns and the villages from Galilee on his way to go down to Jerusalem. It is his plan to go that way. It was said all the way back in Luke chapter 9 that he had already begun to turn his face, to turn his attention to um, his completing his mission in Jerusalem. We know that the reason why Jesus came, though he did come to teach and do a lot of healings and things along those lines, the primary reason why Jesus came was first to fulfill all righteousness um, according to the law, to fulfill the law, and to become the perfect substitute as a law keeper, who is the second Adam, who overcomes where the first Adam failed, and then to then provide propitiation for our sins, satisfying the wrath of God, and being the one who is our substitute in that manner, receiving the full weight and measure of God's wrath against himself, so that those of us who would place our faith and trust in Him and be rescued by His grace would be saved from God's wrath. And so Jesus is continuing that trek down to Jerusalem, and He is teaching on the way and interacting with people as He goes. In Luke chapter 13, this particular passage, it's going to mirror the Sermon on the Mount, which is why I made the joke earlier that Bill preached half of my sermon this morning, so this could be really short. No, I'm just kidding. The, I'm going to preach what I feel like God has led me to preach. Uh, but at the same time, Bill gave us a wonderful foretaste this morning and what he spoke on as we look at the difference between entering the narrow door and going along the wide path. Luke's version is slightly different because it's within the context of Jesus having dealt with some Jewish believers and Jewish unbelievers, for that matter, talking about a fig tree earlier in this passage of Scripture. Um, the next pericope after this one, he's going to be lamenting over Jerusalem. So he has a, 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 a contrast between Jews and Gentiles in mind today as he's speaking this particular passage of Scripture. And that's a little bit of the context of what he's ha what's happening. I think a lot of Scripture outside of context as the primary means for a hermeneutical interpretation of Scripture, I think perspective is the second, one of the second, or one of the other, I guess, greatest uh, hermeneutical things that we're going to speak on. Um, when you think about perspective, it's very, very interesting. Because as we talk about salvation, and, and Bill sort of hinted at this earlier, there are two perspectives when we think about salvation. There's the heavenly perspective, God's perspective, which God is going to elect whomever he's going to elect according to his sovereign plan, according to his decree. But then there's the human perspective of salvation, that which we can see on our side, that which we view not only in ourselves, but in other people as we think about that. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at two perspectives. There's a question that's being asked that has to do with a divine perspective on things. And Jesus is going to respond to that question by saying, uh, or by giving a focus on the human perspective of things. So like James that Bill talked about this morning, Jesus is not contradicting anything that has to do with Salvation that comes by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone, by the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. But he instead is going to focus on the human perspective with regard to salvation. So let's read this morning as we read Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 30. 22, he went on his way through towns and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house 
has ridden, risen and shut up the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer to you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, some are first who will be last. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this preaching time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We understand and believe that Luke, your servant, wrote this scripture under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, as we receive the words of Luke this morning, we are receiving your words. May we receive them in our hearts as such, understanding that this is you speaking to us, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless the proclamation of your word. And whether I stumble over every word and fail in every way, or whether I speak eloquently, Lord, I only pray that you would be glorified. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word this morning. Pray that you would give me the words to speak and shut my mouth when you're through. We ask these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at the narrow door and how God has, uh, uh, this passage of Jesus speaking very similarly to what we saw in the Sermon of the Mount. He talks about the narrow path and the wide path, and he talks about a tree and its fruit, sheep and wolves, those who built their house on rock versus those who built their house on sand, those who display the works of righteousness, those who don't. Those things are all mentioned in, Luke, or in Matthew's Gospel when he talks about the Sermon on the Mount, which we looked at this morning in Matthew chapter 7. And so we see a portion of this, Jesus is going to be speaking that passage here as Luke has recorded it in this particular place as Jesus is walking in his ministry. So what do we see? We see that when it says he went on his way through towns and villages. What, where did we see him last week? He was in a synagogue. He was teaching a woman who was bent over, who needed to be healed. She was bound by Satan. And Jesus had released her bonds. He said, "You are the, the bondage of, of, of Satan against you has been loosed, is what he said. Like, freed from slavery. And so we saw Jesus in uh, a synagogue teaching, and he talked about the kingdom of God. He talked about um, a mustard seed. He talked about leaven and how the kingdom starts out small. But then before you know it, it grows into something gigantic. That it's, it may, what seems unassuming, what seems small at first, actually is something that's going to multiply into a great and mighty thing. And so Jesus was speaking about that last week. And so he's continuing this same sort of thing. He's going through towns and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Luke continues to emphasize that trajectory that Jesus has on his way to Jerusalem. Remember a few weeks ago, uh, Jesus was talking about a fire uh, that is being kindled. And he wished that it had already kindled. And he sort of was lamenting, not, not terribly, but just speaking on how he really wished his time was over in the sense of that the job was finished, that the mission was fulfilled, that everything was completed. Because every single day as he marches toward Jerusalem, he marches closer and closer and closer to his crucifixion. He marches closer and closer and closer to experiencing the wrath of God against him. And so it's a terrifying thing to think about. But more than that, he wants it to be over with. He wants his mission to be complete. Yet, even though he would like to make the fast pace to Jerusalem and get it all over with, in the midst of the time that he has before he goes there to complete his mission, he's got other work to do. As I was reading that, this week it really made me think about how in a world that's so full of sin, so full of pain and agony, sickness, and horrible people doing horrible things to other people, and all the things that we see happening in our culture, in our land, maybe in our own lives, in the lives of our families, our spouses, whatever, we may think to ourselves, 
And I do. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I just wish you'd come back. I just wish it would all be over with. I just wish you would come and establish your kingdom and we would get the resurrected body and we'd be sinless in your presence and we could just be with you. And that's not a bad longing to have. That's a good thing to be looking forward to the return of Christ and all of those things. But then I thought, as Jesus was looking forward to that time, and it would come, and it would be accomplished, He still worked to do in the moment. And I thought that was a good application for us to remember, that though we do look for he heaven, though we do look for His return, we do look for Him to come back, we remember that while we're here, we still have kids to raise, we still have spouses to love, we still have a church to lead, guide, and direct, and to, we still have people to reach for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We still have work to do. Even if we are to suffer under the hand of whatever comes our way, we still have work to do. Just as Jesus was ready for it to all be over and to experience the bliss of His ascension, to go back to His place of glory, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, he still had work to do. And I pray that we would take this in mind and understanding, just to remember, not to be caught up in an escapist or, you know, mentality thinking, I'm not there yet, so everything's bad, everything's wrong, and I hate this life, and I hate going through it. It's, no, we will get there. We'll get there. And you know that, what is it, the, the days are long, but the years are short. We'll be there before you know it. So in the meantime... In the meantime, be faithful. Be faithful to continue the work that God has given you to do in the time that you are here. Find out what God has, has, has uh, uh, put on your life, the calling He's given to you. Do with all your heart. It is not an insig insignificant thing or bad thing or small thing to continue faithfully in the thing He's called you to do until the day that He returns. That's a joyful thing. It's a joyful thing. All right, so let's move on to the crux of the matter. Someone said to him, <laughs> Luke does not identify the someone. I think that's very interesting. We don't even know if it was a man or a woman or whomever. But I think based upon the context, I think there's two things we know about this person. Number one, um, probably a Jewish person, okay, that's in the context of he's working, teaching Jewish people and things along those lines. The person does call him Lord. So there is a potential that this person may be a believer. But, even if they're not a believer, they do understand something about Jesus differently than other people. Most other people refer to Jesus as rabbi or teacher. or We know that you're someone sent from God, you know, maybe a prophet or something along those lines. But this person actually does refer to Christ Jesus as Lord. And so, potentially, potentially... This is someone who has placed their faith in Christ. Maybe this is somebody who has received the gospel. Maybe it's a disciple that's following along. There's no indication it's one of the disciples or anything like that, or like one of the twelve apostles, the twelve. But it could be one of the other many disciples who are following after Jesus. Okay? So, this question comes to Christ. Lord, will those who are saved be few? This is a good question. Because if you look at the construction of it, it's very interesting. Will those who are being saved is the actual understanding. This is a passive voice. This is a person who's actually asking a pretty theologically sound question. This person understands the sovereignty of God in salvation. They understand that we are being saved, not that we save ourselves or have to do some sort of work or something along those lines as we talked about earlier they understand that salvation is all of god will those who are being saved be few and so the question is about number you know who who out there is going to be saved is god going to save a whole bunch of folks or is he only going to save a few folks or what's the deal on this and how is god accomplishing these things and so i just want to talk about this idea of being saved Firstly, I want us to remember that all who need to be saved are everybody. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, from the moment we took our boat first breath, have um, breathed out rebellion against God. 
Everyone in this room has committed cosmic treason against him. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none of us righteous, not even one. That all of us have fallen short of his grace, of his glory, because of our sinfulness. And so therefore, the necessity to be saved is for everyone. However, God, according to his divine decree, has chosen to save some out of the people who have, uh, who are in the need of it. But God has no obligation to save anybody. But this is the idea. This, he's taking things to a very eternal perspective. He's looking at things from a, you know, sort of God's perspective. He's asking Jesus, give us some insight on God's plan. Is he only going to save a few people, or is he going to save a whole bunch of people? And this brings about the second question that I thought, which is, um, save from what? You know, save from what? I, I served many years in the South. In the South, it's a very Christianized culture. People are very uh, close to the church. It's a church culture down there. There are lots of churches. Even in the inner cities of Memphis, whenever I uh, was in seminary there and I was serving in the inner cities of Memphis, you would be talking to somebody and you'd be going through the gospel. You'd ask them the question, what do you think it takes in order for a person you know, to go to heaven? And they would give the answer that you talked about in Sunday school, be a good person, follow the Ten Commandments. Things along those lines, and so you're like, okay, I'm going to share the gospel with you, go through the entire thing, articulate every point of the gospel, and say, you know, uh, uh, would you like to be saved, or something like that. And they said, oh, saved? Oh, yeah, I did that. You know, there's this answer of, because they think I prayed this prayer, I walked this aisle, maybe I became a member of a church. Oh, I'm saved. They hear the word saved, and that sets something off in their mind, like they got some, you know, they had some experience, you know, that, that oh yeah, I've been saved. And they just see it as, I've been saved. But I always wanted to ask, you know, well, saved from what? And, and the idea is that we're not, that, well, we're saved uh, from the wrath of God, is what, is what being saved means. Uh, saved, rescued from the wrath of God. It also means that we have been rescued from our sin, saved from our sin. God changes something in us, and He rescues us from our sin. And so, um, so that's the question. How many people are going to be saved from the wrath of God? And what I think is interesting is this person is interested in the things of God according to a heavenly perspective, but then Jesus sort of flips the script and turns the tables, and He focuses instead on the earthly perspective. See, this guy is asking this sort of third person question, you know, who all is going to be out there is going to be saved? And Jesus turns that and he turns to a second person, you, because that's the second person, even though it's the you isn't there, this is a second person imperative that Jesus is now saying. He turns it on him, he says, it's almost like, don't worry about those people, who may or may not be saved, but you, you strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You strive to enter the narrow door. Okay? Now, our reformed -y, calvinist -y ears might be going, whoa, -ho -ho, this sounds weird, you know. Uh, he's talking about people seeking Wait a minute, I thought no one sought after God unless God draws them, right? And then he's talking about uh, striving to enter. I, it's like, well, I thought we were saved by grace through faith alone and not of works. But remember, like we said, we're talking about two different perspectives here. There's a heavenly perspective and then there's an earthly perspective. And so what Jesus is really saying here is repent. Repent. Strive to enter the narrow door. See, there are different types of people who claim to want to come after Christ. There are those of us who are just looking for some fire insurance. There are those of us who are, I just don't want to go to hell. You know, they want the glory. They want the bliss. They want the no more tears. They want the perfectly healed and well and all of those things. They want all the minutia and the trappings that come with Christ. But they don't want Christ. You see? 
They want the, and they don't like the idea of the suffering. They don't like the idea of the pain. They'd like to be uh, relieved of that. But they don't want Jesus. I will never forget that question, that John Piper question that says, imagine heaven, all the glory, all the bliss, all the no more tears, but Christ wasn't there. Do you still want to go? <laughs> In other words, are you looking for the escape? Or are you looking for Jesus? And that's the idea. When Jesus says, strive to enter, he's, he's saying, you can't come flippantly to me. You come with everything. You are making your calling and election sure. You are ensuring that your faith and trust is in me. You're not, it, it's like whatever Jesus in, uh, in John's gospel. He's out there feeding 5,000 people. Man, he, when you feed a whole bunch of folks, you get a lot of followers then because they're excited about, man, you go to this guy, he's doing these cool things, he's healing folks. <coughs> Excuse me. He's providing bread, he's providing meals and all of these things, and they're all coming after him, and they just love all the stuff they can get from Jesus. And then he says, you want bread? I'll give you some bread. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And people went away. They were freaked out by that. He was saying, you, want, you came here because your bellies were full. You came here because you wanted what I can provide. You don't want me. You only really get eternal life. You really only get that which is the true blessing when you want me. Not just the stuff that I can provide for you. And so that's what Jesus is speaking about here. The, what, what, the narrow gate here, when he mentions this, the narrow is more than just um, uh, small. It, 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 it can mean difficult. Okay, Striving through the narrow gate is it's difficult. And also it's exclusion. Exclusion? Exclusionary? I don't know, I was going to think it. <laughs> uh, it's exclusive. That's better, right? Yeah. Okay. It's exclusive. What he's saying is it's only through me. God does not respect people of other faiths and other religions and things along those lines desperately and deeply seeking to, to come to God in their own way, but are very heartfelt and very faithful to that. God does not respect them. That's not the way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So you can be the best Jew you can possibly be. You can be the best Muslim you can possibly be. That's, God's not going to respect that. He doesn't respect other ways. So narrow also means exclusive. The, uh, the atheist who is trying to be as moral as they possibly can and being as nice and, and, and everything as they can possibly be, God doesn't say, well, you didn't know enough and you just tried your best and, and you know, good try, come on in. No. Narrow means exclusive. Narrow means it's only through Christ. And then also narrow can also mean, it means difficult. See, the entire world is following a current into destruction. The whole world is headed to hell, so to speak. And the culture hates the Lord, hates His law, hates the righteousness of Christ, hates the idea that God in heaven has anything to say to you and how you live your life or run your finances or, or who you love or whatever you want to fill in the blank. They hate that. But the whole culture is going this one direction. And so when we become followers of Christ, we start, we're like salmon. We start swimming upstream. And it's difficult. Do you feel weird? Do you feel out of place? That's good. <laughs> That means you're going against the culture. When it seems like everybody is like, everybody's nuts and I don't understand this. And it's, well, it's because you're going against the culture. You're going against the grain. You're going against the current. And it's not always easy to do. I was thinking of that passage that Bill uh, read this morning from Corinthians, how he talks about we've been through beatings, we've been through shipwrecks, we've been through all of these things. For you, for your sake, Corinthians. For the sake of following after Christ, 
Paul was willing to endure all sorts of hardship, pain, difficulty. And that's the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about here. He was striving to enter the narrow gate. You see? That's what it's talking about. Not that you have to earn it, you, be, you, be, you better work harder or else you can't get into heaven. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, he's saying you, your lifestyle should mirror your claim to faith, so to speak. You're striving. It's not a, you can't half-heartedly follow Christ. It's all in, all or nothing. You are striving with your life to follow after Christ. And so that's what Jesus says. You don't worry about all those other people who are going to be saved. You strive to enter in. Make your calling and election sure. You repent. You get your own self uh, straightened out, so to speak. That's the idea. Don't worry about those other people. You worry about yourself. Make sure you are in the faith. You strive to enter the narrow door um, and enter the kingdom in the way you have been called to enter the kingdom through Christ alone. Then he switches the metaphor a little bit. He says, when, when once the master of the house is ridden, risen <laughs> and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and taught in your streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. So now the metaphor changes to a house and a master. Okay? The house represents the kingdom of God. Okay? The master is God the Father or Jesus could be either one. And so that's the idea. I think it's probably referring, Jesus referring to himself there, because according to the book of Revelation, Jesus says that he holds the keys of death and Hades, and he's the one who opens doors that no one can shut, and he's the one that shuts doors that no one can open. And so I think that Jesus is actually referring to himself in this little parable. and says that he is the master of the house. It's his house. It's his kingdom. He's the king, right? That's what Matthew's all about. Jesus, king, born according to the seed of David, uh, was the established king. He has a forerunner, John the Baptist, who announces his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, therefore repent. Believe the gospel. We see that. He was heralded as he went into Jerusalem because they thought he was going to establish his throne then. Three days later, or excuse me, a week later, they were crying out, crucify him because he didn't do what they thought he was going to do. But that doesn't mean that he isn't still the king because when he returns, he is going to establish his kingdom. His kingdom will be set up and he will reign forever and ever on the throne of David. So it's his house. It's his kingdom. And so what is he saying here? He's saying, you better get in the kingdom while the door's open. That's the idea. Get into the kingdom while the door is open. We have a time, a period that has been given to us. There are two things that will end that time. One is death. And the other is the return of Christ. If we should live to see the return of Christ, that will be the conclusion of this age of grace. This period of time where God's house, his kingdom, has a door open and extended to all people. See, um, we have, on the other is death. When we die, that's it. There's no second chances. There's no purgatory. There's no anything else. It's, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this is the judgment. And so, we have been given this time, this age of grace, this period, where the door of God's kingdom, His house, is open to us. And we have been called to come in during that time. Strive to enter in through that narrow gate into the house of God. There is a general call that is given to everybody. God has commanded us to go into all the world, right? Preach the gospel to every creature. 
He said that it, uh, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and that how will they, how will they uh, call if they have not heard? And how, how can they hear unless somebody preaches to them? And, and, and how can somebody preach to them unless we go do that, right? There's this general call. God has told us to go out and preach the gospel everywhere. We have no idea whom God is going to elect unto salvation and who isn't. So we preach the gospel to everybody. We call everybody to repent. And we pray for people's souls. And we pray that God would open the hearts and minds of people, regenerate them to salvation, and bring them into his house. Bring them into his church. And so there's this general call. That we've been all called to go take the gospel to every creature. But there is a time... When that door closes and Jesus shuts the door and there are people who will not be inside the house. They begin to knock at the door. He says, Lord, open to us. He will answer them. I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and talk in your streets. But he will say, tell you, I do not know where you're coming from. Depart from me, you workers of evil. What is he talking about there? Well, talking about all of those who had proximity to Christ who never entered the house. If you think about it, during this time, he's going and preaching to his uh, people. He's a, born of a Jewish descent himself. He's preaching to other Jews. And that's the, the majority of the people that Jesus preaches to. You know, we, we know there's a a centurion, and there's a Syrophoenician woman, and things like that. There's a few people outside of the kingdom, uh, the covenant community of Israel that Jesus does speak with, but by and large, he's preaching to Jewish folks. And he's out there teaching. He's teaching them. He's, he was in the synagogue last week, proclaiming to them. He's telling them right now, enter the narrow gate. But most of them aren't going to do so. He went into people's houses. Remember, he's in the house of Simon the Pharisee, you know, months back. That Simon the Pharisee, he didn't believe. But here he is eating and drinking with Jesus. They had proximity to him. They maybe ate at the feeding of the 5,000. How many people left there? Never to follow him again. Lost. The day that they die, they may respond to God when he says, why should I let you into my heaven? I was there with Jesus we sat down with him. We were eating and drinking with him. I heard him speak. But they never entered the house. What's the application of that today? Well, it's church folk. Baptized people, members of churches, people who have prayed prayers, walked altars, you know, or idols down to the altar. People who have been born in Christian households. People who have eaten at the Lord's table celebrating communion together. Never regenerate. Never having entered the house. They have all the trappings. They look like fine upstanding moral folk. They look like, as they used to say in Alabama, the good Christian folk, good Christian people. They look like it, but they never entered the house. And so those same people cry out to Christ. Knocking at the door, let me in, let me in, let me in, let me in. We, we were at the church. We heard the sermons. We ate at your table. We were baptized. We were part of this church. And Jesus says, depart from me. You workers of evil, I never knew you. Strive to enter the narrow gate. Be, make your calling and election sure. Verse 28, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. This is so interesting to me. There's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, I, I thought um, Dr. Sproul, uh, when I read the commentary on this, was really, really well put together. The two reactions of people. One is the uncontrollable sobbing, the weeping over, over loss, being lost forever. And the other is the gnashing of teeth. Angry at God, cursing God for 
putting them into this place. In either one, e either place, it's a complete and total uh, um, uh, uh, despair. Either weeping forever, or gnashing and mad and raging at God forever. And they're weeping and gnashing. And from afar off, they can see the saints. They knew Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the faith, in the kingdom of God, in the house. They saw the prophets in the kingdom of God, in the house, they themselves cast out. But then I think it's interesting, he also mentions, um, in the next verse, he says, And the people will come from east and west, and from north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. Not only are they cast out, Gentiles are coming in before them. That's what he's talking about. It says people there, people, that's the, that's the word, the Greek word meaning ethnos, or generally people, the people of the world, the Gentiles. And so not only, not only are Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets, all the Jewish um, uh, heroes, you know, the heroes of the covenant community of Israel are entering in while they themselves are being cast out. Remember, this is a Jewish audience Jesus is speaking to here. But now even the Gentiles are going in before them, those Filthy, stinking, nasty Gentiles are going in before they are. Why? Because they did enter the house. They strove to enter through the narrow gate. While they themselves, thinking, oh, I'm in Israel, or I'm okay, they're cast out. And so that's the idea. And I thought about the application of that in our time and I thought about how, how, how we look to people who are really dirty and really messed up and maybe think badly of them, yet those people who repent will come in before the fine, upstanding, clean, moral, well-dressed people in churches who don't repent. I think about, you know, meth heads and homosexuals and people who are really living horribly awful lifestyles that they have a tendency to really look down on, yet who would repent and trust in Christ, will go into the kingdom of God before those in suits, those who are in church every Sunday, those who look nice, have nice, clean, moral lives, yet have never believed the gospel, have never repented, never gone in the house. So it's funny how we make these comparisons. You know, when we're talking about money and status and things like that, we always compare up, don't we? And we say, oh, I wish I had what that guy had. When we're talking about sinfulness and wretchedness and filthiness, we always look down and we say, oh, I'm not as bad as that guy. Funny. <laughs> we don't look the other way. We don't look and see somebody with less and think about how incredibly grateful we are that God has blessed us with what he's blessed us. And then we also look at the really righteous folk and say, man, I fall so short. Because the fact of the matter is, in the end, we're not going to be compared to one another. We're all going to be compared to Christ. In Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about how Jesus is the standard. Doesn't matter if you grew up Jewish, Gentile, in the church, out of the church, doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. When you're compared to the standard of Christ, we all fall short. So we must not rest on our own righteousness or whatever. We must strive to enter the narrow door. Repent and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. In verse 30, I love how he mentions, Behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. And so if you think about this, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's talking to this Jewish audience. He's saying, those some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. Well, the Jews were first. They had the promises. They have the covenants. They have the law. They have the teachings. They're a priority. When Jesus came in, he wasn't born in India or China or something like that. He came into his own. He was there the first. They were the first to receive Christ into their presence and to hear the gospel. They were the first to receive the promises, the law, and all the traditions that came down through the faith. 
but now they're going to become last. Because now the Gentiles who were last, who didn't hear those things, who didn't grow up with those things, who didn't have all of those privileges that they had, are coming into the kingdom before the Jewish folks. Because they rejected them. And so it's a picture of what we see in, uh, this is almost like a foreshadow of Luke's second chapter, which is a uh, which is Acts, where it talks about how they're going to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most parts of the world. And now we see under Paul's ministry, the Corinthians that, you know, that we read before, Paul's seeing these people, Gentiles, coming to the kingdom of God like crazy. Anybody in here grow up Jewish? I didn't. And most of us in here didn't. But God in His mercy, in His grace, has grafted us into the vine of Christ. Which he began with Abraham and the Jewish nation. But it, we, we've been grafted in. We're the last. We became first through the grace of Christ. And it reminds us, it reminds us that, that the position that we have in the kingdom of God, in the household, only comes through repentance and faith in Christ. Not based upon any performance or works or established you know, race or anything else that we have. But we must strive to enter the narrow door of Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word proclaimed this morning, given to us through Luke, and we pray, Lord, that we would receive it into our hearts and minds, marinate on it and meditate on it in our lives, and ensure that we examine ourselves according to this scripture. I pray, Lord, that if there is someone in here who is trusting in something other than repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, or maybe whose lives, even though they've made some profession of faith, it, they just don't measure up. They don't measure up with what we talked about in Sunday school today or in this passage where there's a claim to Christ, but there's a life that doesn't emulate. I pray for repentance. I pray that we would not hold these things flippantly, but we would strive, indeed strive. The word agony comes from that word, Lord. That we would even agonize over that to ensure that we are in the household of God, in the kingdom. And God, give us grace to uh, seek Christ and Him above all things and find our identity in Him. And if someone in here is not yet a follower of Christ, that they would hear these words and repent. We thank you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.